marketing is applied psychology. It's what you say and who you say it to. And I have met uh, people that have mastered uh, different areas of marketing that know more about human behavior than many psychologists that I've met because they have to not just understand what people uh, do and what causes them to do the things they do, but getting someone to actually respond. So Dean, you want me to start or how do you want to do this? I think, yeah, this would be great. So you've got, we've got the questions. I'm going to let you, um, you know, you've got them printed out there. So I'm not, I won't toggle back and forth, but I've seen some of them. Yeah, um, I'm going to, I want so to start. Actually, so we've got, okay. We got Aaron uh, Masrillo. Um, okay. How do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? So that's mm. the question. And so we, we picked questions. And when I say we, I mean, my team has gone through like a thousand of these questions and we're, we're categorizing them as we do these, we'll continue to answer them. And uh, so, uh, but they picked ones that they felt would be helpful to most people here also. So how do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? And the notes that I wrote to this, and then I'll have you go Dean is mm -hmm. for one, where do you want to stand out, right? It's one thing like, why do you want to stand out in a crowded space? Can you niche it down, narrow it down and, and be in a space where you're not so crowded? Right. That's, that's one way to think about it. And then I want to say this up front because this is going to apply to many of the messages, uh, questions that people will have, which is Dean Jackson's quote about uh, a compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. Uh -huh. A compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. So write that down. We say it on almost every I Love Marketing meetup group, uh, but it's worth, uh, it's worth understanding. So Dean, uh, answer that question if you could, sir. So this reminds me of this uh, thing we've been talking about where, especially in times where people are contracting, where you know, I'm assuming they're saying, how do I stand out and get people to do business with me? That's really what the essence of the question would be. Um, yeah. And the thing that is where the, all the competition is, is at the purchasing desk. That's what everybody's trying to get the attention of the purchasing desk saying, hey, give me a purchase order, give me a purchase order so that I can deliver these wonderful goods or services to you. And you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to compete for that attention. That's where it gets crowded. And one thing that just kind of dawned on me and things like this is that there is almost zero competition at the receiving dock. And if you just go around to the building and bring things into the business, you're met with open arms. Everybody's 100% authorized in any business to bring money in to the business. So if you can, instead of spending time and money trying to fight for attention to convince somebody to give you business, if you spent that same amount of time and attention on just getting a result for them and leading with that, as opposed to, um, you know, trying to uh, convince them to give you business, you, you're going to find that it's a much easier path. It's far easier. Anytime you have the possibility to give somebody a result for free to start the ball rolling, that's going to be a win for you. And it's easy to get attention when you're, when you come bearing gifts, money, the thing that they, that they want business, you know, that's really the, um, that's really the, the thing without knowing the context of what the, um, what the actual situation is, but uh, I'm on the you call. Could, you could apply it to any. Oh, you are okay. There yeah. you go. Let's let's hear what. Aaron, go ahead and uh, elaborate. So I'm in the I'm in the real estate pirate industry. We we're you know we buy the motivated seller houses, yeah. and uh, yeah. five years ago, four years ago, we could send out two or three thousand letters or postcards, yes. and be inundated with calls, like more calls than you could take in a two three day period would come in. 
Now you can uh -huh. send 5,000 postcards and you're lucky if one or two people call. Right. So I switched it up. I went to the, the Genius Network annual event and I met the guys from Tulip Marketing. And I, and I had this idea, like, maybe I'll do a newsletter and I'll send a newsletter out to kind of my target audience and bring value to them. And we did that for a few months. And it was like the calls we got were, is this a joke? Is this a scam? Who are you? Why are you sending this? And very few people called in. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it produced, I thought delivering value and giving them, I mean, we're in California. So there's all kinds of information on, on the laws that are constantly changing and how it affects landlords. And that's really my primary market is marketing to burnt out landlords and then acquiring their properties. Mm -hmm. So I thought doing that, presenting a newsletter with a lot of content would, would generate more leads. It, it, it didn't, it didn't work. So mm -hmm. now it's, uh, you know, we have a lot of wall street buyers and Silicon Valley buyers in our market space. Now mm -hmm. uh, just become very inundated with uh, uh, bigger players who and they can spend $100,000 a month on ad spend. And being backed by Silicon Valley, it's almost as if they don't need to show profit. They just need to show revenue to get right. a million dollar valuation. So yeah. like, oh, we bought 800 houses last year. We made, you know, we lost $100 million, but we're, we're worth $5 billion now and we should go public. So yeah. you have the mom and pop guys like me who want to buy just 25 to 50 houses a year. Mm -hmm. And across the board, we're all struggling. Mm hmm so what's your number one um, challenge, do you think? Like when you're, if you, how are you selecting the homes that you want to buy? So it's based on, on criteria about the, the type of house. Like I, I know uh, very pinpointed on the type of property that I want to buy. So when a call comes in, it doesn't matter the situation or the seller. I know that that house fits. It's a square peg, a plug, a peg in a square, mm -hmm. you know, whole situation. So we're, mm -hmm. can I see one of the letters, Tina? Yeah. So we're trying to do stuff like, like, you know, you know, we're sending out letters and, you know, we're putting in like big dinosaur stamps and we're putting in like, you know, little heart stamps on the outside. Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking like if, 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 if this shows up and it's addressed to, this one's addressed to Caesar and his wife gets it, the open rate on this is going to be a hundred percent because it has a nice big sure. heart stamp on the outside and the handwriting, yeah, right. is, you know, women's handwriting and blue ink. So, you know, whether yes. there's a response from that, I don't know, but at least it gets opened and read and then maybe we yeah. can elicit a response from that. So, and what's inside, what's the offer? So you're saying we want to buy your house, call us. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's a little more personal. Uh, you know, we, we're, I can read you the letter. It's around here somewhere. Um, but just, I mean, just the music yeah, of it. Is it just has some information about, hey, I'm local, I'm a veteran, and, uh, you know, I'm interested in buying your property. It's a really easy process. Uh, so, yes. yeah, it's, you know, typically you like yellow letter stuff. But yeah. I try to do a little bit better on it. Like, mm -hmm. And how, how did Caesar get on the list? Uh, so this particular campaign is a uh, driving for dollars campaign where, you know, we have somebody who drives around and just looks at, looks for properties yeah. that have signs of financial distress, like a right. totally burnt lawn or it's overgrown, broken windows, bad roofs. So yeah. we have about a couple hundred properties on that list that, that somebody's visually driven by and seen and said, man, that's the distress situation. Yeah. Somebody doesn't care. Got it. So if you, so then everybody on that list, you're kind of like, uh, there, they fit that bill. Correct. And so you wonder what would happen with them over the next hundred weeks, let's say over the next, like if instead of thinking we're going to mail the letter, he's going to say, Oh, what a relief. Thank God. Somebody sent me this letter. Let's get out of this today. Uh, but what if over the next hundred weeks, if you looked at it, how many of those are actually going to uh, do something? You know, if you took like a longer um, approach to it, like instead of just one time, like go, going and, uh, you know, I call it strip mining, like just kind of going through mailing the letter they call. That's how it used to be forever, right? You could just mail it, they'd call and you'd buy and it all happened quickly. But what if those, those distressed houses are a problem? Um, and even if they don't reply to your letter, they're still a problem. And what would happen over the next, you know, two years if you take a thousand, how many of those homes do you have on your uh, list? Uh, this one, 308. Okay. 
So of those 308, if you take that sort of longer term approach to it, more than just like the one, one um, your one kind of uh, thing, that I wonder what that would look like, you know? How, how many of them actually do something? How long have you been doing this now? So in the past, I, I primarily have just mailed postcards for years. Okay. And then, yeah. you know, kind of this younger generation came into the business and yeah. they got into skip tracing and cold calling and test, texting and really yeah. voicemail and really just beat us older dudes out, right? So, right. <laughs> so now we've skip traced this whole list and we're going to, you know, do the mail, but then hit them yeah. multiple times through different aspects. So we'll, we'll hit them with the mail, we'll... Uh, try to, uh, you know, find them on social media and, mm -hmm. and do some targeted marketing that way. Uh, but, you know, I open up my mailbox. I have dozens and dozens of rentals here and I open up my mailbox and there's, you know, multiple letters on a weekly basis from Sunday, from Open Door, from, you know, Zilla, from all these companies that are, you know, doing basically the same thing, but yeah. you know, now with the hard stickers and handwritten. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's noisy now right like and that's the thing is what what would be the thing if you were to think would be a a, a softer step than uh call us to buy it kind of thing like one of the things we do with the i work with traditional realtors who want to list those houses right and instead of mailing postcards that are hey list your house with me or call me and start packing or any of those uh you know, personal promotion things, we start offering people the, uh, a report on uh, like the, you know, October 2020 report on Winter Haven Lakefront house prices to start the ball with somebody who's kind of moving forward, you know, what, what else would they be looking at? Do you think these guys, like what, if they're not going to sell, what, what do they need or what would be uh, uh, the answer to their problem? That, that's a great question. I've not been in that situation. So right. uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to discover that and, and figure out how can we, so we were doing the newsletter uh, and, and I thought that would be really effective. We had some, uh, you know, a lawyer writing some stuff about yeah. the statewide rent control law and, yeah. but very, I mean, not, not inexpensive marketing strategy, but yeah. uh, you know, the return was not good. Yeah. Yeah. Very challenging. It is. So I, I think I would look maybe at the um, going back to the ones that you had, from a year ago kind of thing when they first come on that list and just to get a sense of how what is the scope of this how how because they're it um what we call visible prospects you know you know who they are and it's you know likely that they're going to um be they're going to do something at some point yeah our code, code enforcement eventually will get involved as well right so. yeah exactly yeah. Um, another opportunity may be to think upstream about who else is interested in, like not all distressed homes are, uh, are um, run down either. There's no visual. They're not necessarily 100% of the time um, visually distressed mm -hmm. as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So part of the thing is I might look at aligning with a real estate agent who is also wants to get traditional listings, you know, are you a uh, licensed uh, real yeah, estate? Yeah, agent? I'm a broker. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, part of the thing is looking, you may want to attempt that, try the, our getting listings program. And then when the people reply, uh, you've got the opportunity of, buying their house right there for them or then selling those leads to uh to a real estate agent who so wants i have an in-house to... agent that yeah we do that already oh you do okay yeah well that's what i got <laughs> okay so I, is, I is aaron is that helpful 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, this, I, this is amazing that you guys are doing this. I just want to thank you very much. Been, okay. been fantastic. I love being on these calls. So yeah, thanks a lot, Dean. I, I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. And let me always mention this too, even though we have a, you know, podcast here called I Love Marketing and there's so many answers on specific uh, topics that you guys can go and listen to uh, that, are, you know, that are there for free. Um, I wish we didn't have to do any of this marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. I wish people would just do business with us because, you know, we were caring and we were, you know, kind and we delivered products and services, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a very competitive world. And so the purpose of marketing is if this was easy, everybody would be rich. Everyone would be doing well. And, and it just isn't. And so the more that you can uh, invest, uh, you know, marketing is applied psychology. It's what you say and who you say it to. And I have met, uh, people that have mastered uh, different areas of marketing that know more about human behavior than many psychologists that I've met because they have to not just understand what people uh, do and what causes them to do the things they do, but getting someone to actually respond and to give you money and to pay attention to you. And, and so there's, there's a lot to it. So whenever you're in a highly competitive market, uh, you have to you know, find ways to actually uh, break through. And that requires you know, constant uh, thinking about the, um, you know, the mindset of, of the person. I mean, I, I've always liked the Robert Collier uh, line where as a, as a marketer, as a copywriter, you want to enter a conversation that's existing in the prospect's mind. And so, you know, the, the prospect has a conversation. There's something that they have their, to use a Dan Sullivan terminology, they have their dangers, they have their opportunities, and they have their strengths. And so we need to know what their dangers are we need to know what their opportunities are, what you can bring to them and, and being able to get their attention in many ways by reinforcing their strengths. So, and if anyone, uh, this is not really a marketing book, uh, but I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. It's called the Dan Sullivan question. It's all about that. Highly recommend reading that book. It's a good book. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, and what I'm going to do, there's been people that have submitted questions in the chat. The way I'm going to do this because we've had so many questions submitted uh, I'm going to read some of the ones that we have uh, for people that are here first. And then if we have extra time, we'll do some other ones that are in the chat as best we can. So uh, this is from Tim uh, Garrigan, who I believe is on. And Tim, after I read your question, if you want to elaborate on it, uh, what he does, um, his industry is making companies tons of money through brand strategy, world-class digital experiences, and compelling advertising campaigns that drive customer engagement and loyalty. And the biggest obstacle is a compelling reason uh, to talk to us in a full pipeline, which goes back to Dean's statement of a, uh, you know, compelling offers 10 times more powerful than, uh, <laughs> than a convincing argument. Uh, so creating a compelling USP for my agency and how to find five-star customers. That's the question. Um, Dean, I mean, what I'm going to do here, since you're just kind of like just laid back and <laughs> like is, you're, you're freaking. This is pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, you like the Yoda or some shit here with your I massager? guess. I mean, this is, it feels like I'm laying here, but this is like, it's just the uh, best do, place do, to do, do, do you see the tone, of, the tone of my voice that has the resentment that I, that I can't I know, I love obtain it. for your uh, glorious lifestyle that you have here? That's right. That's so, right. So go ahead. Talk about how to create a compelling USP for his agency and how to identify what he calls five-star customers. Uh, do you want to say anything, Tim, before we is answer? Is he on the call with us? Yeah, I am. I, I just want to say thanks. Uh, this is really cool. It's like, what? You're calling my name out. I bet oh, this is great. That was just <laughs> awesome. So thank you. I so enjoy these um, these calls and what you're doing. It's so refreshing and just so, writing down um, inner a conversation that's happening in the customer's mind is brilliant. So, so what kind you. of agency are you? We're a strategic digital agency. We're in our 27th year. Okay. HQ is in Seattle. We're in New York and also in Boise. And uh, we, uh, we, we have big clients, small clients, and um, we're doing fine, but we should well, be doing you, great. Who are you trying to attract? Well, our target customer is a... Um, Someone, a client, more than likely 300 million in revenue and above, and uh, to easy, uh, usually a CMO, um, VP marketing could be higher up, could be C level. Mm -hmm. And um, do you work in any specific niche or? Uh, a good I'm, question. 
No, we, not really. They, all kinds of different. Yeah. We do. We have different, we have different verticals, different categories. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, ag, it's uh, automotive, it's healthcare, it's software, um, it's tech. It's, yeah. Uh, and it's, are they all big national, um, big nationals like that? Or, uh, you know, or? And yes. And, but we also do love having um, some scrappy startups in the mix that we, that ah. we enjoy working with as well. And usually yeah. the way we've been around for 27 years is that, you know, we're only as good as our last project. So we, right. we, uh, so we, we do, we do the first one. Well, hopefully we have a success promise and then we, we get another and another, and then they yeah. leave and go somewhere else and we go there too. So that's kind of how it works, but we do compete with the big six agencies. We're, fiercely independent and so it's a, nobody knows who we are right right so, right you know, that's that's the issue i think the thing that is really intriguing to me about the agency business both on the small scale and the large scale is the capability stack that you have of what you can actually do right what you know how to do and uh you know i do you work on a, um on a a performance basis or on a fee for service or a percentage of spend or uh, that you're, you're being compensated for the, the, the work or the, or the result? Uh, good question. We, we haven't, ex we haven't done that because we feel mm. like, we feel like there's so many variables in that with on their side. Um, so no, we haven't, we, we haven't, found that that works for us. We're project based. Um, and, um, and so, but we do think about, we are aggressive listeners. We're yeah. solution based. We love creating successes. Yeah. Like it just feels like now that it's so easy to integrate with other companies, right? It's so easy to plug things in to another stream or, or whatever. And it feels like, like as an agency, you've got an opportunity to be a, a a vending machine. You know, we often talk about these things that people are looking for certainty when they're doing advertising. They're most of the time treating it like a slot machine where they put it in and pull the lever and hope sometimes money comes out. Woohoo. And sometimes it doesn't, but they just rack it up to, well, we just got to we'll make it up in volume kind of thing, or they keep uh, going. Um, but the other side of that is being able to have a vending machine where you can put money in and have a fixed cost for um, what you're getting. And so, so I wonder about selling leads or selling the, the album without it being attached to the labor of it, you know, or the, um, yeah, the process, you know, because mm -hmm. um, that feels like if you can focus on, on, uh, you know, new banking leads or new, uh, you know, whatever type of, of has a national scope, if you've got an algorithm that works that you've discovered from one, um, group that often the companies have a, a large uh, budget for predictable outcomes. You know, if they knew that they could buy this many leads for this much uh, money, that feels like it's a, um, you know, a really great opportunity there. It's a differentiator too, in a way, you know? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, after the, you know, who Gary Vaynerchuk is, of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing, there's a clue kind of in his agency, this whole intention is to build up the agency doing client work to learn and get the data and get the capabilities so that at some point, if there's a downturn, he'll be able to buy a brand <laughs> for four dollars and deploy his team on it and ramp it up and sell it for $2 billion. 
you know, that that's, that's really the thing is that your capabilities deployed with a partner or with a, um, you know, with something that you control rather than trying to constantly parade and convince big companies to choose your agency over somebody else's um, for, for client work. It's, yeah, the um, partnership model. That's a really a good point. Looking at right. partners even if you think, that have a new avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you were to think about like 20% as a, because it, it sounds like you've got some, you do some big business. Mm -hmm. Sounds like even having 20% or a, some portion, a division of your, like a startup within your capability set of exploring stuff like that. Like, you know, if you look at the total picture of things that there's so many, there's so much private equity out right now that are holding companies buying things. If you could get aligned with a, with a holding company that's buying a company that will now drive it up, that you could be that capability set for them without them having to develop it in-house or... Uh, yeah, that's right. the kind of things I would be thinking about. Dan, Dan Sullivan calls that the free zone. Yes. And I think that's something that's a pretty big um, uh, opportunity going forward. Thanks so much. I, I You're welcome. so appreciate it. Yeah. Wonderful. You are welcome. Thank you. So uh, Thee Con uh, Convery, hopefully I'm saying that right. I'm going to always mess up everyone's name, but um, are you there? I will ask the question because I see the in the chat. All right. The question is, well, this person's in a financial services. I'm a Luddite and I don't know how to bring an online product <laughs> to market so much so that I don't even know the question asked. So the question is, I'm pretty good at attracting my perfect clients to my wealth advisory practice. They are few and far between and that's okay by me, i.e. perhaps less than 5% of the population, but how do the best, how to do best monetize the rest that I attract so as to help pay for the marketing that attracts the perfect match. Um, what are your thoughts on that one, Dean? Well, there's a lot of open loops there. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do we, what are we, uh, are they with us? Yeah, I am. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, there yeah. we are. And by the way, so I quit butchering your name. What's the, is it Thee? It is Thee. Okay. Well, is yours Joe? Yeah, it's it's yeah. Joe. Joe. No, I'm kidding. Joe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's Joe. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Joe. That's well, yeah. By the it's, way, I I wrote a Joseph, note. Joseph. Re register uh, thesefreebook.com just because I want you to take all of your knowledge that you have and you're going to put together a book that you're going to offer for free just like I Joe do with joesfreebook.com. Make sure it's a really amazing book like my book is at joesfreebook.com and uh, register the site. And that's one way just to, whenever you're being interviewed, whenever you're talking to people, whenever anything, you just, it's different than just telling people to go to joepolish.com because like, okay, what are you going to get there? You're going to hear about me. You're going to see stuff that I link to and stuff I offer, but Joe's free book is pretty obvious. It makes it clear. And so if your name is available as a free book, all of you that are listening, register that. And if the first name is taken, then register your full name, you know, like Joe Polish free book or whatever. So, so go ahead, Dean, and Dean, ask whatever clarifying questions you need so that you can, uh, Eunice actually gave me a new term for what Dean is, uh, you know, Elf, how I talk about easy, lucrative and fun. Today, Dean is easy, lazy and fun. That's a, <laughs> a new way. So, so go ahead, Dean, ask any clarifying questions that you would need. Yeah. I just have to comment. I cannot not comment on your little uh, wizard in the uh, background there, the picture. Mm -hmm. so, somebody's got to keep an eye on me. Okay, I guess. Okay, so what? Uh, who are we trying to attract? Uh, high net worth individuals, preferably uh -huh. uh, retire, already retired. Yeah, and what does high net worth mean to you? Two million plus. Okay, and how, how do you traditionally find them? Uh, well, coincidentally, Joe, I have a uh, free book that um, uh, I use uh, direct mail. 
yep. and newspaper ads to drive to the book so that I get uh -huh. a name and an address. Okay. That's awesome. And is that, uh, does that work? Do you send postcards or direct mail or how do you uh, find them? Yeah, I prefer something going in, an, in a stamped envelope. Okay. Uh, but you're and able a, to get... And a newspaper ad would be a, a, a local full page um, uh, paper. I like that. And so how, uh, though you can't target as much with the newspaper uh, ad as you can with the getting a people over 2 million. Um, but what, how much does it cost you to generate a lead now? Somebody to download your, uh, your book. About $230. Okay. And, um, uh, it's not a download, Dean. It's, um, no, it's, a, uh, it's physical. a physical book. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so there's something that you want to look at what would be, um, the title of your, uh, of your book. How are you promoting that? So the title's called Wealth Solutions for Life, the seven mm -hmm. questions you must ask before you hire a financial advisor. Okay. And so when I'm going to say is that if you were to think about the book being more outwardly focused about the conversations that are going on in their mind, kind of thing initially, right? Because we've got to be, Joe uh, always talks about it. This, the, uh, what I say about a compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. And what you're saying, when you say things like seven ways to choose, you must say to choose a financial advisor is essentially from the context of you saying it, feels like it's going to be a book that is seven reasons you should choose me is essentially what it's going to be. Is it going to be a very subjective uh, book, right? That is, you're going to set it up to be the thing. So all of these things about calling, um, you know, when they call, it's almost like, you know, the call now trained salespeople are standing by and we'll rush your auto debit commitment contract. It feels like it's a, um, like a, a sales process, right? As, and it, as and it is. To, and it is, absolutely. So when you look at, um, I'll show you one thing that we did in the um, financial world, um, that when you start thinking about joining the conversation, that's already going on in the minds of your, your prospect. One of the things that people, um, one of the things that people always um, are thinking about is how much is enough. That's really one of the things that, that people, uh, that's a, a question that people are, are on their minds. And when I, when you think about that, um, I'm going to show you something here. Am I set up to share screen, uh, Joe or Eunice? Yeah. I, yeah, you okay, should be able great. to do that. Um, yeah. Let me just uh, open this up here. Um, I'm going to show you a postcard that we've done for this exact kind of um, thing. Okay. Is it big enough to read? I'll tell you. So here's a book. Um, you know, we mailed this book, um, postcard, and the, the headline even, three avoidable surprises that derail even the most cautious retirement plans is a, are words that have been chosen very specifically. Like when you look at most direct response, when you look at those um, um, the approach is the you know, three biggest mistakes people make in retirement would be kind of the go-to words that people would use, right? Mistakes. But when you're talking about money and you're talking about um, people admitting to something that nobody wants to admit that they're fallible, right? Like when you say three biggest mistakes, you first have to admit that you are not smart 
in a way, right? So when we talk about, but surprises, anybody could get caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. But then when you modify it with avoidable surprises, that puts possibility back on them. It's up to you. There are surprises, but they're avoidable if you knew what they were. So there's that whole mystery there. And derail the perfect foil for on track. We're on track for retiring or on track for our, our income in retirement. Uh, even the most cautious, better than conservative, cautious is a word that everybody would agree is a good thing, but conservative has a labeling to it, right? Conserv uh, conservative has been those things. So joining these things makes such a, a big difference. And so when I tell you that we get book leads like this for $10 instead of $230. It, because it's more outwardly focused, right? It, because people, it's, they're selfishly interested in the contents of it. Does that make sense? Very I mean, much so. And it, it yeah. does, uh, and this so almost we, looks like a magazine ad, but it really matters not where you use this copy. Right, we do it both as a postcard and yeah. as a uh, as a magazine uh, ad. But that's a you know that I just wanted you to see like the mindset of um, meeting people where they are. You know, that's really the uh, that's really the big thing. Now, along with that book, maybe you said them then your book. This is what Joe and I I've I've shared for years about, you know, because Joe very successfully used the Consumer Awareness Guide to Carpet Cleaning, which I view as a Profit Activator 3 lead conversion tool, more than a Profit Activator 2 lead generation tool, right? Mm. A free carpet is a compelling offer that is going to get people who are interested in carpet cleaning to raise their hand. But when they get that consumer awareness guide, now they're getting educated about more than just that the price is the, uh, is the thing, you know? Yeah. Got it. So, so it's still an ethical bribe. Um, yeah, of course. Um, but it's more um, what's in it for the consumer as opposed to what, that's what's the whole in it thing. for me. That's the whole thing, is that that's really the most of it, is what's in it for me. That's the only thing that people are tuned into. Does that make sense? It very yeah. much so. And yeah. yeah, and that way now you're that the sharing with those, once you identify them, because your whole thing is to try and turn um, invisible prospects into visible prospects. And so if you're running a magazine or a newspaper ad for, I imagine if you ran that sort of an ad in the newspaper that you would get really great response to, uh, to something like that. So not only would my cost per lead come down, yes. um, but I, I have arranged it that uh, for those that don't qualify, I can sell to, uh, to a colleague. So it helps fund my marketing. Perfect. Exactly. Because you might get people who have 500,000 in investable assets and you're just looking for the 2 million, right? So yeah, that's yeah. smart. Very, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Awesome. And by the way, Dean, I'm going to show real quick. Um, and I'm, there's two people I'm going to call on three people, actually, Shane and Angie Saunders. They're going to talk about some breathing stuff and a question they may have. And then um, let's see, Marion Abrams. Uh, we just did an interview. Uh, she's got an awesome new podcast, which I recommend everyone. I'll ask you, Marion, to uh, uh, post the, the link to the one that we just recently did. And you can tell people about that. I'll do that in a minute. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen on a computer. That's not my main computer. Let's see here. So this is uh, joesfreebook.com. And so what I'm doing right now, I'm not really putting people into upsell funnels or anything like that. I'm literally just giving the book for free. If they want a physical copy, 
they can pay for postage. Um, and then, you know, it's just, you can check this out and you can model it. Just don't plagiarize. I don't, I'm not big on people that plagiarize. Um, download your free copy, first name. See now the opt-in, the uh, squeeze page whole thing, Dean Jackson invented that back in 1997, mm -hmm. which he never gets enough credit for because it changed the world of marketing. So what's inside the book you'll discover. So there's just some stuff, you know, life gives the giver, takes from the taker, uh, testimonial from Richard Branson um, about me, blah, blah, blah. That's a really ridiculous picture. And then uh, other resources. And this is where we put, you know, the Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery, the uh, uh, links to I Love Marketing, 10X Talk, my podcast, Genius Network. So yeah, but I put that all, the main thing is just to give away the copy of the book. But that's just how my site looks. So you can do, there's nothing majorly complicated about any of this. Just, uh, you know, think about it. One question was, you know, does it need to be, is the S best to have at the end of the name? I think the Joe's free book is, probably better than Joe free book, but you know, it, you can, you can probably get both of them or if one's taken, you know, get your full name. So those are just some thoughts on it. We, at some point we'll, we can do a fuller deep dive in, into that. Uh, Marion, talk about your podcast real quick, because on the episode we did, I talk about basically being a drug addict and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, people I think have really liked it. So, and you also. It was, it was a really fun one. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're awesome. So tell people what your podcast is about. So the podcast is called Grounded Content. And uh, the description is tactical and effective meets grounded and honest in advertising, marketing and content creation. And so the idea is just to talk about this idea of how you can be an effective marketer and do it within kind of honest, moral, real human bounds. And Joe and I covered a lot of topics. It was about a 45 minute to an hour by the time it was done. So he was patient with me. But we got into addiction and we talked about, you know, scoundrels in the business and some of the unethical stuff, but also just some scallywags. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. It's one of my favorite clips when Joe says it's a it's a business. He says it's a business full of scoundrels and there are people out there that would sell you shit in a box. And it's <laughs> a great, a great metaphor. That should but become course, the meme. Yeah, well, we had another guest who talked about uh, a vending machine full of poop. So, I mean, oh my, <laughs> yeah, but that, it's a that's, good interview. Yeah, that's the whole thing we try to convey is that look, the, all, all money earned ethically is a byproduct of value creation. You can use a lot of trickery and stuff, but at the end of the day, if you're going to make, you know, if, if you're going to make ex, ex, exciting. Um, grandiose offers i mean you better be able to live up to the messaging and and if you don't you know you have to you have to try to live with yourself and uh, we've been in this business a long time i've seen a lot of people become very famous very quickly with good marketing but they didn't have the character and the ethics to to uh, stand behind it so it's it's really it's a weird world uh but you can marketing is so important and so critical and so valuable uh, it's just using it in the right ways. And what always strikes me about just, you know, my little rant here on ethics is if you understand the lifetime value of a customer and you understand that it costs more money to uh, acquire a new one than it is to keep an existing one. I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't make much sense to, uh, to shortchange people or to not deliver because you're just going to, you know, you're just going to make so much more money in the long run if you have happy clients, you know, just like Dean talks about in the before unit, the during unit, the after unit. I mean, the after unit requires people being happy so they will do business with you again and it will create referrals. And so, uh, yeah, I'm amazed how many people come in and they just only see one part of this marketing uh, game. So, but yeah, my point is uh, subscribe to Marion's uh, podcast if you like it. And um, so Shane and Angie, you guys want to ask a question all the way from, uh, Australia. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon for y'all. What, what time is it there? Uh, it's five thirty. We've been 5 up. Thirty a.m. We've been yeah. up since four. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Well, awesome. Great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's all right. We're early risers anyway. So, um, but thanks for having us on. Uh, we do have some questions that we're bantering around um, in working out what is um, probably the one that we need the most support with right now. Um, I was thinking, look, um, Dean, we uh, last saw you um, in the room with uh, Taki's, Taki's event, event back oh, when right. you came out here to Australia. Yes. Right, right, yes. right. 
So good to, good to see you again. Um, and I, and yeah. the question, question kind of surrounds around um, tracking the intangible or even like sales or marketing around the intangible. Cause um, you know, as, as you know, Joe, like for our business, like in health and wellness and helping people to feel better, you know, quite often it's like it, people, it's so easy to forget feeling good or tools to feel good. So one would be like around being able to uh, measure or track uh, results in feeling good and being able to use that in like a marketing context. And, and just to give you some more context, mm -hmm. Dean, we specifically the tool we use is breathing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about breathing, but it's not really about breathing. It's what the breathing gives you. So that's been the challenge for us has been that you do something that's so simple um, that everyone has some awareness of, mm -hmm. but when you actually get into the practices, they have a profound effect and they rise, you know, all boats rise with that, with that kind of thing. So it's, it's been mm -hmm. hard for us to kind of pinpoint, um, exactly what it will do. Cause it, Cause it the results are different, different, for everyone. Yeah, different, different yeah. points mm -hmm. for everybody. Well, it's interesting because you reminds me of, um, you know, I heard one that the, the, we have one word for snow and the Eskimos have so many different 50 different words for snow because there's all kinds of distinctions and granular things that you need to be able to know about what type of snow it is. Right. And so I think that for most people breathing is like snow. It's just got the one word for it. Right. That we don't know. One of the greatest things for quantifying qualitative things, because that's essentially what you're trying to do is if you can point out what some of those distinctions are that you're looking for and people a way to find themselves. Dan Sullivan has maybe one of the best scorecard systems, the only scorecard system I know of for quantitating or you know, quantifying qualitative things. So if you were to think about the uh, the seven or eight most important elements of breathing and have, you know, the way he sets it up is you have little description of where you would fall on a progression from you're failing at this one, or you're frustrated with this one, or you're winning traditionally with this one, or you are transforming, which is a lot of times people who might think they're winning, they're in column three that, right? You give yourself a score from one to 12. So you can be one, two, three, or four, five, six, or seven, eight, nine. But you give yourself a score for the statement that fits the most for you right now. So you, this, this, is, this was how, how you would describe who's failing at that element of, of breathing then somebody who's frustrated with it recognizes that they want to do better in this one. They recognize it as a problem and they want to do better. So we give them an opportunity to give both the score where they are right now and the score where they want to be. So you could rate yourself, I'm a four now, but I want to be a 12. And in column four, when you kind of describe the best possible outcome of applying this principle or this mindset or this activity or this, whatever distinction you're making about breathing, because I don't know anything about what you're talking about, but I know that you know what those kind of distinctive elements are, that even the people who think that they're winning at that wouldn't recognize that they have a problem sometimes reading column four transforming they don't even know that column four exists as a possibility and so they think wow i thought i was really doing well with that but i'm not this i'm not the way you describe it as what it would be to be transforming in all of these um, elements and so when people fill out a scorecard like that that gives you a um the basis for a conversation because if somebody's falling or failing uh, or frustrated at you know three of these elements and you know how to get them to the next one it's really a great thing for you to show them
the protocols, the interventions, the practices, the uh, tools, whatever it is, supplements, whatever they can do to improve along that plane, and then constantly get them to presence their advancing up the, the chain. And if anybody who's firing on all four, you know, on all cylinders in each of the uh, things is going to be, they're going to know that something changed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very helpful. That, Thank that is, you. Yeah, the, especially the distinction for the qualitative, yeah. getting, getting that down. And is that well, used well, as like a lead a couple magnet? Of those. Sure. But that would be a lead conversion tool. But tell me, mm. what are the things that um, that are the intangibles about breathing? Like what are, what are some, if you were to think about a couple of those elements. Mm. Yeah, well, one, of the, one of the top ones is lowering reactivity um, and in Managing doing that, it, it, it raises creativity. So they have, they often have as one comes down, one goes up sort of thing. If you have a negative come down, like reactivity, you know, um, the other one is also being able to have a lot more space to uh, monitor what you're about to say rather than reacting uh -huh. and just blurting stuff out. That that so That is responding a, a versus one. reacting. Yeah, right? totally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other one is just a, a, a change in the way people feel time as mm -hmm. well because the stress factor comes down in yeah. in uh you know in, in being able to breathe more efficiently you get a you get a very real kind of you know feeling of lowered stress calm yeah. enjoy calm yeah. enjoyment of time rather i find than that thing like getting enough. grounded into changing the granular time is racing um you know often i have a rolex with a sweeping um second hand and often if I'm racing or if I feel something, uh, I can, if I just center myself to watch that sweep and breathe for two minutes, it's a completely different, mm. uh, it's a recalibration, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So they're, they're, they're the real intent. And the, the other one is, um, you know, understanding also that, that, if your CO2 levels, if, if the gases are out in your body, it'll, it'll have you show up cranky, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll feel off as well. And, and there's some very See, simple that's great. tools to balance that out. So when hey, you look let, at let those me, things, let me mention something here. Uh, the, I want to, Ray just posted something. And by the way, I keep up with it, reading what I can. I can't, uh, sometimes I miss some of the stuff. So I apologize in advance. Um, but Ray wrote, what's the end result that Shane and a Angie, Angela are look I just say Angie, but Angela, Angelina uh, are looking for their guests with that specific solution that they are not finding in what they are currently doing. Just curious. Hmm. Yeah, I look, you might get two different uh, answers here. <laughs> well, for, for me, what I'm finding is that there's a lot of people seeing, seeking a lot of help outside themselves, like psychologists or chiropractors or massage mm -hmm. or um, supplements. Um, but really, the answer lies within. So it's being able to um, tap into those internal tools that you have to be able to use uh, in the moment to calm yourself, to know, uh, connect with intuition, know what the next step is for yourself. So rather than looking outside yourself, it's finding the solutions within yourself. That's kind of like on a high level. I think that for me, the, the specific one is, is really showing up, like how you, what, how you show up in your presence is everything, whether you're in sales or whether you're leading a team or whether it's just in general relationships. And that's a, it, it, it seems to be a, for, for me looking at it, it seems to be an intangible thing, you know, getting people or, or, or telling people that they're gonna show up in a better way by linking it to something like breathing, which it makes sense if you then link it back to health, link it back to, to feeling better, to having lower reaction. So it's just, it's for us, it's been a challenge in, in sort of pinpointing that. But I, I like what you said, Dean, about having qualitative points there mm. that, that, that are relative to everybody. I think that that's, mm. uh, that's gonna be really helpful. Yeah, definitely mm. how you show up matters, resonates with all mm. of our clients. So I would say if those things, if you think about the overall, the end uh, result of it, that would be your book. That is the, the, when all of these things are firing, this is the outcome that you can have. And you each one of each chapter is one of these elements 
And then so the next step after somebody has the book is to take the scorecard, get their, their score. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we do. You know, I do the, the, uh, the Breakthrough DNA book, which talks about the eight profit activators. But then the next step is our profit activator scorecard that we set up at profitactivatorscore.com. And you can see how people can go through, they fill it in online and we get the notification that somebody has done the score, but we see where their, uh, where their um, gaps are. Yeah, like kind of like a spider graph. Yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. We love that. Uh, let, me, let me say this to, uh, to uh, Angie and to, um, you know, that weird little husband there, <laughs> Shane. No, so I've been doing, uh, I've been doing uh, breathing weekly things with, uh, with Shane that I just started. Uh, and we did our second session uh, a couple of days ago. Yesterday. No, day before yesterday. Day before yesterday. And uh, they're really awesome. I mean, they're really awesome. They know their stuff. And, you know, we, the book uh, Breath by James Nestor is an amazing book. Love that book. And what I almost think that what you guys are teaching, I would almost have a, a group of people, you ask your clients, what is the result you've gotten in your life as a result of what we're doing? Because, you know, I used to be a cocaine addict. And when I had to snort cocaine, I had to breathe. But there was this product in between called cocaine, which was very expensive. And if I was just breathing without the cocaine attached to it, it would have been way healthier for me. And I would have felt amazing had I learned how to do that. And so we, you know, this thing, like my father died of lung cancer from uh, smoking and, uh, you know, I hate cigarettes. And I also very much understand why uh, cigarettes are very addicting. You know, it's not only the, the nicotine um, and as, as all addiction, it's all pain. It's all, it's all an attempt to soothe pain. Uh, you know, it's, it's drink the pain away, uh, screw the pain away, gamble the pain <laughs> away, eat the pain away. I'm trying to find the proper un, unprofane word for, uh, you know, sex addiction. Uh -huh. uh, but basically you got all this pain. And so you got a world of people in pain right now, you know, with the pandemic, there's a lot of pain in the world. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of bad news. And you guys have really, you know, solutions to it that is very is accessible to everyone if they only knew what that was. And so to go to, to Dean Jackson's, you know, compelling offer, when you're so close to it, it's that whole saying that I first heard from my buddy Clay Bear, which is it's hard to read the label when you're inside the jar. And so that's why we have things like this, because dealing with other people's marketing problems is, is uh, you know, much easier than dealing with your own. I mean, I could present all of my marketing problems that I have, which I have plenty. In, in Genius Network. And there's so many people on the line here that would have really good advice for me if I was to throw out one of my marketing problems, right? Because I'm so close to it. And that's why me and Dean really started the collaboration with I Love Marketing because over 10 years ago, we were having a conversation, just sharing ideas with each other for each other's businesses. And we said, like, do you know how valuable it would be if other people heard this conversation right now? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we started. So one of the things I would suggest to you and everyone here, when's the last time you ever asked your clients, why did they do business with you? What is the result that they got? And so, and because the best marketing sometimes that you're ever going to get is never going to be written by a copywriter or written by you. It's going to be literally stated or shared or written uh, by one of your you know, existing clients and all of the obstacles and reasons why people don't do business with us, we can go and ask why, why didn't you buy? What, what was it that wasn't, you know, compelling enough? What, and ask them because that's some of the best uh, market research that you're ever going to get. And I cannot tell you how many people try to hire uh, consultants and different things to figure out stuff that if they just did some initial legwork uh, would never be quite ever, ever experienced or shared in the same way. So when I was doing drugs, it was a shortcut to try to feel, I was trying to feel better. Right. Um, but they had a product. And so when you have breathing, it's free. How do we charge for it? Right. So the more that you can get to the, what, you know, now if you inserted cocaine in there with it, you can make a lot of money, but you'd be fucking screwing people. Right. It, it, it doesn't help. And so like, that, that's, that's my whole thing. When there, there's a lot of people here 
that the very best stuff they have, they give away for free, hoping that someone buys the commodity, hoping that someone buys the thing. And if we can get really clear on what the result is, that's why Dean's always talking about if you can create a result in advance. And so I would encourage you almost to do like we're doing here. And this would probably apply to everyone. You know, go to your list and say, we're going to have a conversation and we're going to invite you all for free. We're going to do a Zoom meeting and you just have a conversation with everyone and say, like we're doing right now. Like a lot of people, the answer to what it is that a lot of you need, we're doing it right now. Just do it with your own clients, your own sphere of influence, your own friends, even your vendors. I mean, those of you people that you pay and say, hey, I want to have a Zoom meeting. We're going to talk about how to improve like our offering here or what is it? And you'd be surprised what happens when you crowdsource knowledge uh, from, you know, people that have, have uh, you know, experience with you and saying, what is it that we actually do? What does this do for you? And yeah, so those are just some of my thoughts. Oh, that, that's brilliant. I just started doing interviews, um, but it's so time consuming. So it's like the, the road to the answer is so slow. And I said to Shane, I said, we should run something like this with our people so we can get, you know, crowdsource knowledge, but I didn't use those words. So this is perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, look, what are we doing right now? We're creating a podcast. Mm -hmm. All of you are participants in this. We're doing Q&A. It's beneficial for everybody. We're also doing stuff. Now, me and Dean could be a lot smarter. I mean, we're, we're frankly not. We don't monetize this podcast very well. We never have. We don't take sponsorships. We probably should, but we have it. We've been offered thousands of dollars that we just haven't formalized in terms of, I mean, we've, we've not pitched people on a, I love marketing membership group. And there's tons of our members that would sign up for that in a heartbeat. You know, we've, we've gone over a lot of stuff, but you know, we're just trying to be useful. And there's, there's a lot of value that comes with just trying to be useful. Also, it gets you to understand, you know, kind of what's going on in the marketplace. I mean, I, I like teaching people. I like facilitating conversations. I like curating stuff. I mean, I learn just as much from doing these as people that may be listening learn. Not all of it applies to everyone. I know some of you are going to hear cuts like I can't, I don't see how that applies to me. But if you're really listening to how all of these things could apply, uh, then, then you're going to find tremendous value out of these sort of conversations and just these discussions. And more than anything, just having a discussion with well, like right now with, for Genius Network, people that are coming to Genius Network. So, you know, we, I want people that have a million dollar plus business to come uh, it joined Genius Network, which is a $25,000 a year group, and people to come to this year's annual event. And we did a meeting last week, which we only had a couple of people give talks. Uh, and and we had, it was mainly me and uh, Dean Jackson were probably the longest conversations uh, based around, like, I know I'm being successful when and different things. And the, the, the reviews, because we ask all of our members each day that are paying twenty five grand a year, to, co to come to this is a virtual meeting, you know, it's called a feed forward form, you know, how to rate it one to 10. What did they like? Best idea? Did they connect with anyone? I mean, just they love this meeting. It was like the best virtual meeting that we had done. And it was really not about uh, speakers. It was around conversations. It was around themes. And so right now I'm doing as deep of a dive as I can with our Genius Network members around their dangers their opportunities and their strengths. Because if the marketplace changes, if the economy changes, uh, like you may be in the same business like the restaurant business, but the DOS has changed. The DOS of, my, of your clients is always moving uh, their dangers, their opportunities and their strengths. And, and the more we know about that, the able we're able to speak to them. Because uh, you know, marketing is storytelling. And so sometimes if they're not responding to your story, you know, would you keep reading the same bedtime story to your kids if they hated it and were screaming at you and crying? <laughs> no, you would try another compelling, interesting, you know, story. And I speak out of ignorance because I don't have kids. Uh, the thing, though, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, because, you know, humans are just monkeys that drive cars. So we just need things that excite all of us monkeys and get them to say, woo, you know, that's, that's awesome. I want to pay attention to it. So the uh, best way to do that is just uh, get, a, get a group of your clients together, people that love you, know you, like you, trust you, and just have conversations with you. And the harder conversations really are going to people that have never given you money and asking them, like, I'm not trying to sell you anything here. As a matter of fact, I'll give you some of what I have for free. I'll give you a course for free if you could just honestly tell me what could I have done that would have made this offer really compelling to you. And if you do that, you're going to get really good advice from your clients. And, 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 and I swear to God, this will happen. A lot of them will buy your products. If you simply ask them why they didn't buy, because now you've given them, some of you here will make 
a hundred grand with what I just said. If you take it seriously, just go out to your clients, show them your pitch, show them your website, show them the thing. What, what could I have done better because people support what they help to create. And, uh, that's sort of the psychology around it. All right. Uh, put put your you. website guys in your, uh, in the uh, chat. So people that want to sign up for your stuff, which I, I do recommend it's really good. It's yeah. worth all the money they charge and it, it, it will and can change your life. This what they know about breathing and health. And, and obviously they're staring at their uh, computer screen with their, you know, blue blocker glasses to protect them <laughs> from all the evils of sign I all noticed that. that. Yeah. Make sure yes, you wear thanks. the blue blockers when you watch the social dilemma, because you know, you'll see all the evil, <laughs> evil stuff in the world. Um, Serious about our health and sleep. <laughs> oh yeah, no, you are. I mean, yeah, you're, you're teaching me a lot of stuff about all of the, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I can just share with you. It's not, it's not just a, a little bit of knowledge. I'm actually starting to learn a lot that these guys are teaching me. So I, I, I recommend it. Um, Okay, so let's do the next question. Uh, is Francis on? Let me see, because I'm not going to ask questions if someone's not on here. Francis, are you on with us? Sorry, bear with me, guys, while I look through all, uh, the uh, the names here. No. Nope. All right, Francis' question will not go. Okay, uh, is Samuel Stone on? Samuel? Nope. Because what I'm going to do, if, if they're not here, Why don't I'm just... you just tell me what movie you want to see? Yeah. See. So let's see. <laughs> Janik, are you on? Where did everyone go? They just don't I like hope, me I anymore. I hope everyone caught that Seinfeld episode. I'm glad you caught it. That yeah. made it worth it. As long as you caught it, that's all that got it. Uh, go ahead and, and speak to that, uh, Tim, if you could. Because as you know, Tim, I've only seen one epi episode of Seinfeld my entire life which was the very last episode. That's the only episode of Seinfeld I've ever seen. That, that Even though episode, we have it in our sales copy. That episode wasn't quite as good. Everyone's told me that. So, so just to relate it, so we're having a Genius Network annual event, November 6th, 7th, and 8th. And we were playing with this sales copy. And so Seinfeld was the self-proclaimed show about nothing. And so that's kind of an ongoing thing with Seinfeld, Seinfeld show, Seinfeld. And, and Joe said, you know what? I don't, want to have, I don't want to have speakers this year at the annual event. I want it to be about dialogue, not monologue. So we came up with this headline. It's, instead of the show about nothing, it was the, the annual event without speakers. So anyway, that's how that all came together. But I don't know how to explain Seinfeld in, in 30 seconds, Dean. Can you do that? Well, that episode was Kramer's phone number got mixed up with the movie phone That's number. Funny. And he kept answering the phone. And then he was playing the voice of trying yeah. to, what, what he's like, you know, if you'd like to see this movie, press one. And this movie, press two. And he realized when they pressed the number that he couldn't tell what number they were pressing. So he said, why don't you just tell me what movie you'd like to see? <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'll tell you, like, I, I have, I learned the most, uh, and I've read over a thousand books. I've spent over $2 million on my marketing education. I've, I've been to more freaking seminars than anyone that I know. And the, the thing that I learned the best from now are discussions, just discussions mm -hmm. with other people that, because I, for some reason, I just tend to go deeper. Uh, and that's why I created Genius Network, because I just wanted to bring together very smart people and connect uh, geniuses. It's a tribe of tribal leaders. That's the way that I look mm -hmm. at it. And, and, and everyone gets smarter. It's the whole, and I don't try to be the guru. I don't I actually don't like anything about fame. I think if your pursuit uh, in business is about being, you know, I'd, I'd much rather be well, uh, you know, some people would rather be well known than well paid. I'd rather be well paid and not have hardly anyone know who I am. Uh, Cause there's, you know, it's hard to keep up with. I mean, I get, you know, I get 50 to 200 messages a day requesting stuff from people I don't even know. And it's impossible to, to keep up with it and try to do the best. And, 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 I'm, and no one even knows who the hell I am, maybe in the marketing world, but it's like being really famous is like crazy. So when, when Dan Sullivan makes the distinction between status versus growth, you know, if your pursuit is status, it's, I think it's kind of like, uh, it's like cotton candy compared to real nutrition when it comes to, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So anyway, so Dean, uh, why don't we, uh, I can, let's just open it up for people that have questions here. Um, That's what I was saying. Why don't you yeah. just tell me what movie you'd like? <laughs> yeah. So go ahead, Dean. Why don't, yeah. why don't you, why don't you make the request, Dean, of, of the rules and regulations of how to ask us a question? Okay. Ask it quick. We've got, I've got 12 minutes. So give us, we're going to, yeah, somebody's the first person I see with their hand raised. Amy. I saw Amy had her hand raised there. Go ahead, Amy, unmute yourself. And then I saw Eddie and I saw Ray. Okay. So um, I love listening to all the ideas and I work in nonprofit world. And so for me, everything is about the story and about inspiring and engaging people. So what do advice to you? And I don't care. Um, I like to pay my bills, but I don't care mm -hmm. so much about um, money for me, but money to raise is mm -hmm. what I care about. So what um, advice do you have for someone like me? What kind of nonprofit are you? How, how are you raising money and what are you raising it for? Okay. So Monday I did a charity golf tournament called Putts for Paws and uh -huh. we funded a service dog for a local veteran. Okay. And um, I work for Fairway Independent Mortgage. And so I do a lot with the American Warrior Initiative. Okay. Um, and then I, um, I'm a mentor with the Travis Mannion Foundation, and I'm a chapter president for the Association of the United okay, States. Okay, so is your, you just, you are a fundraiser for, um, for different nonprofits? I, I, you lost me in a second. Okay, you so, had, uh, can, so I'm just starting to kind of brand myself as a volunteeraholic. Okay. I, I do, I've done grant writing. Yeah. Uh, and created events mm -hmm. and just raise money if if it's you pitch your nonprofit and it's mm -hmm. really amazing then i'm going to do whatever i can to help you be successful sounds like the flavor of uh, joe volunteer joe what's up with that well chip still has it i was actually talking earlier today with someone that wants to get very actively involved with it here's what i would recommend for her is yeah. to to reach out to candy valentino because Candy actually is, she has a animal sanctuary in Pennsylvania. She helps people with nonprofits. If you're, you know, what, what I would encourage you to do those, you know, it's, it's like, boy, Dean, is there a way to do that? This would be really valuable for everyone. This may not answer marketing questions, but you know how your units of time, whenever you spend uh, time, do you, do you think you could write that out, Dean, and share your screen or just hold it up uh, like a piece of paper? Do you have anything to write on there? Of which? Like the unit of time. So say for one, 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 two, 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 three, three, three. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything to, uh, to write to with. Right. You want me to with. write it out? Like, I, well, how could you explain that? I mean, in a way, because I think you can get your, like, look, I'm taking a one year sabbatical next year. And the reason is, is because uh, entrepreneurs that are too tightly scheduled cannot transform themselves. And there comes to a point where you have so much shit on your plate and so many opportunities that you get opportunity intoxication. Yeah. And I, I've often had this conversation that if there, if someone like showed up like a ninja in the middle of the night and said, you know what, you can't call the cops. There's nothing you can do. If we catch you working on multiple podcasts or running different mastermind groups or selling books, all you can do is one thing. And if we catch you doing anything else, there is no escape. We're going to kill you. And you're all, you can only send out monthly client newsletters by direct mail. That's the only thing you could do. You know what would happen? I'd probably make way more money. Oh yeah, of course. Free time. That's I'd, so I funny. I was these... thinking yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I was thinking the same exact thing. It's so funny. But then so... we try and wiggle and try and make a bigger context that makes everything you're doing one thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it... you were saying that. Go ahead, go ahead, Dean. Sorry. Yeah, when you're saying that, Amy, part of it is. Uh, your profit activator one is select a single target market. And so if you are thinking about like uh, if that was your heart to help uh, things like that is to pick the uh, category like that, like animal shelters or, or um, you know, whatever your uh, main thing is. And if you've got a, if, if I were thinking about taking one local animal shelter that I would put through the eight profit activator process of finding donors and finding people, um, you know, who are going to uh, support this shelter. 
part of the thing is making it real, you know, like putting the, the um, animals telling the stories of the animals are breaking down what your money is actually going to be used for, you know, like what does it, what could somebody um, wrap around um, their mind around, you know, and you might have some really think about getting some um, creating some experiences or, or things for the, the big donors to, to, get that uh um you know joy of giving kind of uh thing going but if you create a process that is that works in a local uh market for a local animal shelter then you've got the opportunity to syndicate that to make have a lot of good done you know where you can take a real process that any animal shelter could use this or any women's shelter or children's shelter or whatever. I'm just using animal shelter as a proxy for a single target market. Um, that could be an exciting um, opportunity to make a big impact, you know? Well, yeah, look, I think the same sort of things. I'm still Richard Branson's largest fundraiser. I gave Bill Phillips the idea back in 1990. 6 1997 that made him the single largest individual contributor in the history of the world for the make a wish foundation uh, you can apply marketing principles to for-profit non-profit movements whatever and so the eight profit activators that we have i'm gonna ask gina on my team gina and tarna and denise they're on my team thank you guys if you could post the uh, link for people to get breakthrough dna many of you here if you've not read breakthrough dna read it if you have read it read it again and um and actually, Gene already did post it. It's right here. It says, get this report. Want all eight profit activators. So read that. It doesn't sell anything. It just literally, I don't think we sell anything on there. And if we do, you guys should give us money. But I actually, I don't think we sell anything. I think it's just valuable stuff that lays it out. And it, it would apply to that. So, yeah. There we go. Right, um, cool. Okay, I'm going to turn into a pumpkin in four minutes. So what do we need to cover in the next three minutes, Joe, before I jump off? You don't have to go, but. Well, yeah, I like how you just leave me here every time, Dean. Yeah, that's like, every time. Just, yeah, just let me do all the work. Yeah, that's how this, this, how this relationship <laughs> works out. Just so you guys know, partnerships, they're never 50-50. There's always inequality. Someone's always rowing the boat more than the other person, just so everyone's kind of clear on this. <laughs> no, it's totally fine, Dean. By the okay. way, I'm speaking later today to the UN on VR in a virtual reality headset. And so we're going to talk about VR uh, to the UN later today. Uh, do we have a link to that where I could share anyone if they wanted to watch it online? If there's any way, if anyone wants to watch me and Nick Janicki and we're, we're, cause I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm building a VR company that's actually getting built while I'm on sabbatical, believe it. I love it. Send yeah, it over. Yeah. But it, so Dean, you can, you can take off just what, well, tell people okay. summarize uh, the eight profit activators so that that's a, cause so much of the answers we get every uh, out of the thousand questions that we have been submitted over that, I mean, yeah. it's like way over, uh, I swear, like 60% of them could be answered if they read Breakthrough DNA. Yeah, so absolutely. Give, give, give a summary of the eight profit activators real quick. Well, you know, the summary of it is really about recognizing and dividing your business into three independent units. The before unit is a supplier to your during unit that supplies people who want to do what it is that your business does. The during unit of your business is the part that helps people get the result that you help people get. And the after unit is about nurturing lifetime relationships and orchestrating referrals with the people who already know you, like you, and trust you. And so the profit activators overlay on top of that structure. And when it's just enough for you to download that book, go through each of those, but to wrap your mind around, what would it be like if your only business was finding people who want to do what it is that you do and you didn't have to actually go through the process of helping them? And what would it be like if your only business was working with the people that you've helped? maintaining a relationship with them, looking for expansive additional ways to help them, orchestrating referrals, 
and referring them right back to your during unit who just did um, what you do. Sometimes you're going to have a natural affinity with one of those uh, units of your business. Sometimes all you want to do is the during unit. If you're a, a dentist or a therapist or a coach or a chiropractor, you just want to do the thing that you're tra trained to do. And it would be such a blessing for if you had a before unit who was just feeding you all the customers that you could handle. That's what the before unit could look like. And the after unit being just about everybody that came to you comes back and refers their friends and you're nurturing that and orchestrating that. It's, it can transform your business in so many ways. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's universally applicable, applies to any business. They're, you know, uh, expandable and they are uh, what I've really spent a good portion of my life um, figuring out. And, and I can't see it getting any less exciting over the next 30 years. So uh, that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Dean. I okay, guys. Have a, have a good time. So okay. I'll wrap up here in just a, a few minutes here. Uh, Teresa, uh, Bill, uh, can you pop on real quick and tell people about uh, Steel Flow Mace? Hey, Joe, everybody. How you guys doing? Yeah, you weren't expecting this one, I know. So <laughs> I really wasn't. Um, so I, um, I'm a steel mace flow coach um, based out of Arizona. Um, and uh, steel mace flow is, is a relatively new fitness practice. It's a fitness movement practice that incorporates a lot of things. Um, it's kind of a combination of its intentional movement. You use a... Um, a 10 pound steel mace, which I actually have one in my office because a lot of people are like, what the heck is a steel mace? It's great, so, it's great to keep by your bed too. I mean, if anyone ever breaks in, I mean, that, that's a good weapon. It's very cool. Um, so 10 pounds is all on the, the end and then there's a four foot tail. So it's a lot of eye hand coordination. It's a lot of mind body um, connection and movement. Um, it's a lot of mobility but it's also a, a mental practice where it's kind of um, movement medicine, movement therapy, um, and incorporates a lot of breathing work as well. Um, so it's a relatively new practice, um, but I've actually put, put a steel mace in, in Joe's hand, which was really yeah. cool. And um, yeah, so right now it's, it's uh, trying, to, trying to get the business going on the side because um, I still have a full-time job, but eventually it's something that, that I want to do um, and and bring to uh, bring to the masses. Yeah, you know, uh, what, post your um, post your Instagram or wh wherever's the best place for people to follow you uh, in the chat, if you could, Teresa. And if any of you want to try something really cool, I would I would encourage you to hire uh, Teresa, which I have, to teach you how to do this. And 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 she's awesome. And Marion Abrams actually posted, uh, this is great. I've only sent, seen men practicing this. Yeah. The first time I actually did it was with, uh, with Mike and with uh, Joe DeSena at the Spartan world championships. Joe DeSena is the founder. And that's how me and Marion met because she's been uh, working with Joe uh, and all the Spartan people for, you know, quite a while, many years. And uh yeah, Steel Flow Mace is pretty awesome. So go ahead and share that. I, and, and by the way, when I do call outs to people, I wish I could do this for everyone. I mean, one I've been talking with, uh, you know, Dean about at some point we should do a, a show and tell sort of thing where we have everybody pop on and just talk about what they do and how they do it and, and that sort of thing. But whenever there's just unique, cool people and I've had experience with it, uh, I, I like sharing it. it. It's not, you know, there's a lot of great you know, knowledge and products and services out there. But what I really like are, are, are the people, you know, I like cool people. So when I get to experience that, I, I like share that with, with everyone. So I'll do one more question. If anyone has like one, we'll do a, a, a real quick one and see if I'm okay. David, David Hill. Just unmute. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thanks for uh, picking me. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. For doing this. Um, so question is on focus, man. I, I am fairly newer to marketing. Um, I've always been into prospecting, you know, cold calling and built business doing that. So now with the marketing, 
Um, you know, I'm part of your genius experience. I'm working with Tim. Um, I feel like there's so many different things coming at me now. So between, you know, the stuff you guys share with the genius experience and then with um, Tim's coaching and Ben Hardy has a coaching program and Michael Burnoff has this challenge and it's all, it's like all these things are coming and I'm just like, okay, what, what do I focus on anymore? I'm almost like backing off now. Like, wow, there's just so much. Yeah. Um, do you, do you get what I'm saying? I don't oh, know I'm, believe me, I'm, I'm a master at putting myself into an overwhelmed state and, t and biting off more than I can chew. I've done it for many, many years. And, mm. uh, like my, my buddy, Gary Halbert, you know, uh, used to say what, as we get older, what, uh, a lot of people consider wisdom is simply fatigue. And so there's, you know, there's a lot to be said about, uh, there, there's a lot of things to choose, uh, from, and we, the more that the world becomes convenient. And the more options we have, if you have a thousand options, you don't have any options. And that's one of the challenges. It's the paradox of choice. And so I think it all, here's what I would say. So BJ Fogg, who uh, you'll see a short clip of him in uh, The Social Dilemma. Have you seen that movie, Social Dilemma? Watch it on, uh, watch it. It's on Netflix. And uh, Tristan Harris is one of the main guys in the social dilemma. He runs the Center for Humane Technology. He was actually one of BJ Fogg's students in 2006. And so BJ runs the, uh, you know, the behavior design lab in, uh, at, at Stanford. And I actually went there last year and spoke to his uh, students, which was great. And we filmed it and I'll eventually put that out. Um, BJ wrote a book uh, called Tiny Habits. Um, and so what, what I'd like everyone here uh, to do, uh, if, if you have, oh, thank you. Wow, Giselle, actually. So here is the book, Tiny Habits, BJ Fogg. This has been voted the best book of, of the year, uh, best business book of the year uh, at Amazon, even though he never wrote it to be a business book. This explains all behavior, right? And behavior, is, uh, behavior equals MAP, which is motivation, ability, and prompts. And so the reason it's so easy to get sucked into news or, or apps or anything is because all the prompts have been built in to the apps, right? It doesn't take much motivation or ability to look at porn. I mean, it's just built in, right? And, in, and to look at anything that's, that gives you a continual dopamine hit. And for entrepreneurs, they get excited by new ideas, you know, especially quick start entrepreneurs. And I'm one of those people. I'm like a kid in the candy store. And so I, uh, what I found is whenever I get super overwhelmed, the one thing that brings relief to me is to add a new project to my plate. Very, and, and from a dopamine standpoint, it's whenever I say yes, I get a little dopamine hit. When I look at a new course or a new book or a new piece of learning, I'm like, wow, 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 wow. And it's, it, it's, it, it creates frenetic, crazy opportunity intoxication. And so in order to address this, uh, usually, you know, I, I have, I've spent many years doing recovery work. So I've learned a lot about powerlessness and I learned a lot about addiction. And so there are habits and then there are true addictions, which are a whole nother thing. But with tiny habits, um, you know, you're obviously a motivated guy. You're, you're pursuing these things to learn stuff, right? And you're trying to get abilities in order to produce a result. But there's these prompts. Everything that's happening is pulling you in. And so we have to create rituals. So when uh, Shane and, uh, and Angie were talking about breathing, great ritual, like to pause. I've got, uh, Giselle, do you mind coming up here? Maybe, maybe we can do something crazy and just, uh, we'll, we'll invite them to one of our yoga sessions. So Giselle has been doing uh, private yoga with me for five years now. And how do you slow, how could you recommend that someone slows and calms the mind? Uh, because I'll tell you, yoga will do more for you for me, I should say me, not you, because how do I know that, right? Depends on if you do it. Uh, I think it'll, it does, these sort of things do more for me than reading books on priority management and time management. Seriously. It's sure. a, it's a, the issues are in the tissues. So it's, I mean, I think that the easiest, simplest task you could do is um, it's called equal part breathing. Basically, you could just sit right where you are. And it's just the way it's a meditative technique. It's also a breathing technique. Uh, basically, you would just close your eyes on your own, and when you inhale, you're just going to count up to a number, and whatever number you get to, you stop, and then you take that same number and count back down on your exhale, and just do that three or four times. I mean, you could do it right after this ends. It takes maybe two or three minutes, and that's a really great way to you know, create presence, calm the mind, and 
And those deep, slow breaths will start to stimulate that parasympathetic nervous system, which is where you're trying to rest and calm. Um, but that's just one really simple technique you can do any time in the day, two minutes, all day. We just did... Uh, we just did our first yoga session. We're doing one tomorrow for Genius Network members. And yeah, because and I, I, I'm always apt to try to be like, open it up for everyone, but we probably should do that since we just started this. But we're literally taking these very successful entrepreneurs that are in Genius Network and introducing them to a way, because they're all dealing with this, David. Like the, the world is dealing with this right now. It's one of the biggest things for entrepreneurs. There's so much stuff. There's so many books to read. There's so many things to pay attention to. And when you're, you know, an ADD, you know, the best thing about being a, your own boss is you're your own boss. The worst thing about being your own boss is you're your own boss, right? There's, there's that accountability mechanism. And so I, I've always loved the line when you're looking at the mirror in the morning, you're, you're staring at the problem and you're also staring at the solution. So the question becomes that. So developing the rituals and what I, the story I tell about Giselle, I had a breakup uh, you know, back in 2016, that was really painful for me. And I was talking with uh, Giselle, uh, you know, uh, about it. And she said, you know, uh, this line she said to me, which I've repeated, I've gotten many, many people to start a, a, a yoga practice as a result of this conversation I had with Giselle was if you do, she said, if you do yoga three times a week, it'll change your body. If you do it every day, it'll change your life. And so I made a commitment to do yoga every day for like a month, even though I was busier than heck traveling everywhere. And, and it wasn't a YouTube video. It was like, go to a class or do a, you know, a private session. And so I did that for like 31 days. And then um, I took a day off and over a 90 day period, I did 82 or 83 sessions of yoga. And it completely changed the way that I respond to life versus reacting to life. And what I found is when I'm super overwhelmed and I'm really stressed out, I react. And that's just, and, and you see a whole world right now reacting. Even last night after the debates, if you look at the news, a bunch of fucking people reacting, right? And mm -hmm. to, to shit that they can't even control. And so we, 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 when people are really stressed out, they're, they're not responding with ability. They're not being responsible. They're reacting. So whatever can, you can look at your schedule, the to-dos, the opportunities in a state of responding and saying, do I, you know, the best time management advice that I've ever learned from very successful people, because I know quite a few billionaires and I know some very successful people, is time management by attitude, which is I don't need to do any of this shit. And so you pick the stuff that you really want to do. And so my filter, is it elf or is it half? Is it easy, lucrative, and fun? Is it hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating? Or is it hard, annoying, lucrative, and frustrating? That's helped me quite a bit to view people, projects, books, courses. And you know, there's a chapter in my, uh, you know, like with this, we'll explain all behavior. There's a chapter in, uh, you know, Life Gives to the Giver, my book, you can get it, Joe's free book. Where, you know, I'm gonna read it if I can. Yeah. Uh, hold on, it's right back there. Let me find that because we just redesigned the cover. By the way, I'm gonna ask you guys, which cover do you like best? Put in the chat, put either blue cover, this will be blue cover or yellow cover. I'd like to get what cover you guys like the best. Can you see those? So yellow cover, or, or this is blue. I'm looking in the reverse camera. This is uh, blue. This is, well, let's call this one yellow. Just type which one you like the best in terms of the cover, because I'm, all right. So there's a chapter in here. Let me see if I can find it. Boy, because, <laughs> oh, look at this one. When you're overwhelmed. When you're overwhelmed, think about everything on your plate as possibility, probability, time and money. Here's how it works. Dump all the projects and things on, uh, on your mind onto a list. Then for each ask, uh, how, well, number one, how possible is it that this will work? Two, how probable is it that this will work? Three, how much time is this going to take? And four, how much money will this actually make me? So whenever I get super overwhelmed and I do like, you know, Dean Jackson's 50 minute focus finder, you just dump every to do and then you put next to it. Is this possible? And the problem with being an entrepreneur is everything's freaking possible. Mm. Oh yeah. I can build a rocket and go to the moon. You know, people do that. Uh, how probable is it? You know, what's the probability? Like, is it possible that I could play NBA basketball if I really, yeah, it's, it's possible if I somehow managed to buy a team, is it probable? Not likely. How much time is it going to take? A lot. How much money will it actually make me? So I look for things that high possibility, high probability, low amount of time, lots of money involved, 
if you're looking at it simply for money. But then for me, I look at it as elf. Is it easy? Is it lucrative? Is it fun? Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, Thank you. Yeah. And so there's another one here about books. <laughs> I actually flipped through this. This is actually, okay. The best way to read a book, get dirty. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to read this chapter and people that read their own stuff are usually got a lot of dysfunctions, by the way, I'm just pointing that out. I remember Evan Pagan uh, mentioning a great way to get the most out of a book. He didn't say this to be sexist, but he basically said, your book is your bitch. A lot of people read books cover to cover, even when they aren't into books and they aren't finding it as useful as they thought it would be. They have this guilt they put on themselves about finishing the book. You may even pick up a book recommended by someone and you get 20, min 20 minutes into it, completely unimpressed, yet you keep reading it. Stop that. If you don't immediately resonate with something, forget it. If you, you don't need to read the whole thing, that's what's, take what's useful, leave the rest. And don't be afraid to get the book dirty, write in it, highlight what's important to you, jot stuff down in the margins, circle what pops out, rip pages out. This way, when you look at your notes, the important points stand out. The same logic applies to eBooks, whatever else you read on your tablet, Kindle, iPad, smartphone, whatever. Mark it up, make notes and highlight it. Just don't write on your computer with a big marker because that would be pretty idiotic. So, um, yeah, that's a chapter. But I, I look at things that way. You know, ask yourself what needs solved. And that's where, you know, if you're going to sign up for a group, will it help you solve what needs solved? Uh, you know, I think people come here because they're looking to solve marketing problems. Uh, but my thing is I just try to sell people what they want and give them what they need. And I'll tell you, like, one of the best ways to make decisions is get better sleep, get sun in the morning, don't stare at computers at night. And I violate all of these things. And I'm continuously working on just getting better at it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll tell you, like, uh, I, I put, uh, we just went through the, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is great. So Giselle made me this daily non-negotiable. She just handed it to me. It's a card. We learned this process from a BJ Fogg training. So non-negotiable, sun in the AM, meditation in the AM, exercise, gratitude journal, vitamins and water, and one minute drills. Okay. So <laughs> it's, it, and then what, what I'll do is I do them. I will put the, the, this into the back of the card like that. And then I know which ones I've done and then which ones need to be done for the rest of the day. It's simple little card, little post notes, learned it from BJ Fogg. He does it with household chores, you know, things he needs to do over the weekend. And he has a weekend thing. He pulls it out and he just gets done and he never forgets. Jason Campbell, tell people about Zen wellness because it kind of ties into the things I was just talking about. Yeah, it ties into uh, a lot that you're that you're talking about about the meditation and making meditation a habit. Uh, you can go to everyonecanmeditate.org, and we have a whole program. It's a free meditation challenge. We have a whole portal that you can do, and that you can build a habit. You can start a very tiny habit of meditation in just five minutes a day. You can even do it less, but I suggest starting with the five minutes a day. Um, and it also ties into really everything that you've been talking about, all the breath work, uh, the breathing and the meditating. We call it sit, stand and move, the three different types of meditation. Love it. And Jason's awesome. He's uh, top uh, billboard for meditation music, number one in Amazon for uh, meditation music. He's, he's a wonderful guy. And so, yeah, check him out. Oh, and someone made this comment. I just have to comment on this. Uh, someone loved the chapter on, uh, I'm just reading some of this. Uh, I love uh, getting my books dirty. And then, I, and then the comment I see writing in my books is sacrilegious. Still can't go. Okay, so this is my a BJ Fogg book. Oh, is this one? Oh, no, this is not mine. Is mine in my backpack? Where's my backpack? I want to, if I, this is just a brand new one we have here. I think it's in there. I hope. If not, then is it? Okay, perfect. I'll be able to demonstrate. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be able to demonstrate to people that I, so here is just an example of how, what I do in a book. Okay. I just like fill it up with notes and underlines and highlights and, uh, you know, red markers, blue markers, just I write, I'll, I mean, just fill it up because that's what, that's how I use books. And, you know, you're making an investment of your time, your money and energy. You can only spend time or money in, or energy. Uh, if you have to look at it, another way to look at it, bronze coins, gold coins, silver coins. Take a look at everything you're doing today, every person you're talking to. And if you had to say, this is a gold coin, this is a bronze coin, this is a, you know, 
silver coin and there might be some diamonds in there. And so give your attention to the things that matter most to you. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I, I, half my time is spent on addiction recovery stuff that makes me no money. Uh, Cause I'm not just doing this game for money. Money's important. I like money. You know, people say money isn't important. It's stupid. You know, try living without it. Money's really important. However, it's not the most important thing once you have it. Once you have a mechanism for making money, then you would think that the reason of making money is to fund the type of life you actually want to want to lead and the things that, that matter to you. And so make sure that you don't make everything about the pursuit of money at the risk of your health, at the risk of your happiness. You know, find the things that really bring you joy and tie as much of your business around it. And I also, I love achievers. I'm, I'm like big on helping growth-minded entrepreneurs. So, you know, and also one more thing that's helped me is who do you want to be a hero to? Like David, to your thing, you know, I want to be a hero to entrepreneurs and people that struggle with addiction. Not big into bureaucrats, not big into academia. Uh, you know, not that I, you know, I have a lot of friends in, in those worlds, but I, you know, my time is spent giving my time and energy mostly to entrepreneurs and, and people with, with, that struggle with addictions because I don't like human suffering and I'm trying to use my marketing skills uh, in that, that arena, which is why I created Genius Recovery. So, uh, all right, guys, read Breakthrough DNA. And if anyone wants to come to our annual event or wants to see the process, just go to GeniusNetwork.com because we have everyone fill out applications. And a lot of that, well, well those are for people that have a million dollar plus business. Uh, and also you can just see how I do the marketing because we have a lot of really good stuff there. So I wish everyone well. Uh, go do some push-ups, drink some water, and you've been staring at a computer screen for a long ass time right now. Burgundy, what's up, Burgundy? You ought to T tell people what you do, Burgundy. Oh my you're, God. You're a badass IP attorney. Yeah, uh, so my passion is helping other, what I call heart-centered, heart-centered smarty pants. I love solutionaries. I love people that are going out there and giving their gifts to just make it better. Um, so that's my passion. And look, I'm, I'm a lawyer. We do litigate. And in my world, what I see are there are those out there that will um, hire counsel to go out and club somebody else over the head like a baby seal because they can. Yeah. And look, there's a lawyer for them and I'm not it. It's just not what I stand for. So um, I love groups like this and peer groups like this because it really just speaks to my heart. So I think like-minded individuals really coming together to make it better, it's absolutely possible. It's, um, it's that Margaret Mead quote, uh, never, under, never think that a few caring people can't change the world because that's, you know, that's all who ever have. And I think in today's day and age, what we're realizing is that there are so many of us that are like-minded. So I just love it. It's powerful. It's soul food for me. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, so great to have you here. Thank you. And by the way, I'm glad that Giselle just showed me this. The live stream link that I have is for the 1500 people as part of the UN delegation. So uh, we don't have a public link. Uh, if, there, if I can get one uh, to show up, I'll go ahead and post it on my Instagram uh, at, uh, at uh, Joe Polish. Uh, if, if, I can if there is a public link that you guys will be able to find, I'll post that if I can. And if not, then I'll just fill you in on how it went to speaking to the UN on VR. So have a wonderful rest of the day or evening, wherever you're at, and we will talk to you guys next time. Thank you.